Hey everyone, this is Luke Johnson from Noetic, the Humanities Teaching App. Today I'm joined again by Dr. Jonathan Cook, and we're going to be talking about Herman Melville's Moby Dick. Uh, this is my second time reading it, and it uh, did not disappoint. I think I got even more out of it the second time. Uh, how many times have you gone through this book, Dr. Cook, in your life? Um, I think I've read it... Um Oh, uh, probably about eight times, eight or ten times. I have to say, though, that uh, at least a couple of those times were listening to it um, uh, on uh, recorded books uh, because there's a really good uh, narrator uh, for that, um, uh, you know, uh, reading experience. So um, it's really enjoyable. It's something everyone should do at least once is to listen to it. Um, and uh, to supplement their reading. Well, you, that's that's an interesting point uh, and uh, an interesting philosophical thing to discuss one day. But so I had, I do have to confess, I've only read it with my eyes once, and I count reading it with my ears as a way of reading it as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you know, I consume a ton of audiobooks. So it raises an interesting point about whether or not that is actually reading. Um, I used to not think so. As I've gotten to work more in audio, I've I've grown to. Um, accept that as a form of reading, but that's probably a topic for another day. Yeah. So to, to me, I, I like, I don't know really what else to say. This is one of my favorite books. I, I really <laughs> struggle to find a book better than this. Um, I, I, I've, I, I, I really don't know what else to say about it. What about for you? How does it rank in your, your hierarchy of, of texts? Yeah, it's, it's pretty high up there. Um, and um, I mean, I, it deserves all of the reputation that it has. Uh, I mean, it's too bad that people know the title and they hear about it, but they, uh, I mean, if you go around and ask the number of people who've actually read it and uh, can discuss it, it's, it's probably pretty small, even though it, it ranks so high as a classic. But uh, it, it, it's just a, it's a wonderful read. A lot of people are, intimidated by the language or they get to the whaling chapters and they <laughs> they get through a couple of them and, and give up but uh, it's too bad because uh, the whole the book is really just a has such plenitude of you know information and adventure and philosophy and religion that uh, uh, it's just an education in itself, and it's all driven by the incredible um, linguistic abilities of Melville to, to create the story. And uh, you know, be, some of it is very entertaining. I mean, the first chapters of Ishmael's um, quest for a whaling vessel are, are just brilliantly funny and absorbing as as narrative go. And I think a lot of people, uh, you know, if they gave that the book a chance, they would. They would uh, really get into those comic elements and 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 savor them. Uh, it's just I think when they get to the 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 whaling material, it seems like you know what is all this about? What is this doing there? And then they get to the the drama of Ahab. They don't really know what to make of it because it's it's kind of shifting course all the time. But um, you have to read it through once at least, and then go back and think about it. You know. Yeah, I think you're right to point out just how luminously philosophical and religious and how beautifully it, it's written. I mean, I, I think Melville's full skill set is on display here. Um, and I think I remember being exposed to it when I was younger in high school. And if I just got caught up in the narrative, like a uh, crazy man who pursues yeah. a white whale, uh, lots of slaughtering of whales, I, I, I don't know the relevance of this to me. But as you grow older, I think it becomes more significant. Of course, there's no compulsory reading as you grow older, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Maybe there should be. Um, but so why don't we uh, talk a little bit about the context of of this text? Like, you know, how did how did it come to be? Like, how did how did Melville write it? Where did he write it? Um, yeah. Exactly. I don't know if it's obvious. I think people might assume that it's written in. In one particular place, but I don't. I don't. I think it's it's quite curious its origins. Yeah. So it was composed in 1850 and 1851. Um, you know, Melville had written five novels, 
before this, two uh, two picaresque novels about uh, the South Seas based on his own adventures on the Marquesa Islands and Tahiti, you know, those are uh, Taipei and Omu. Then he wrote this very interesting philosophical novel called Marty, which was, they, people consider it kind of a dress rehearsal for Moby Dick. Yeah. It's very long, it's, it's, it's all, it begins as adventure, nautical adventure, and it turns halfway through into um, religious and political allegory. Uh, but it's a very fascinating book. And uh, Melville was really, I mean, he said it in the South Seas, more or less. Um, but he, he used it to make all kinds of interesting comments on contemporary politics, religion, culture. Because uh, it ends up being a kind of symposium with a bunch of guys in a, in a big uh, Polynesian war canoe. <laughs> going That's around great. visiting these islands in the Pacific yeah. and each island is sort of representative of some philosophical ideas or some kind of um, political uh, statement or something like that. So it, um, it didn't do very well when it was published uh, in 1849, um, but I think Melville, it gave him a chance to sort of realize how much he had to say to people. and. Uh, he had a few people who thought it was brilliant, um, but they had to make an effort to get through it. And then he, you know, after that he published uh, Red Burn and White Jacket, which, in which he returned to a uh, realistic uh, narrative of, uh, first of the, uh, a young person based on his own experience in the Merchant Marine going to Liverpool and back. And then <clears throat> he wrote uh, a book that's based on his own experience in the Navy, because he went back from uh, Hawaii to Boston on the on a, on a naval battleship, uh, so he signed on to make the trip back to the U.S. after he had ended up in Hawaii. Um, so he had published five books. He was uh, living in New York with his wife and his his young family. He had a son by this point, and he took a trip to England in the fall of 1849. Met a bunch of authors and publishers bought a bunch of books, and he came back uh, in January 1850, and at that point, you know, Moby Dick was clearly uh, germinating in his mind. Uh, so he began sometime in the winter of 1850 in New York City uh, writing a book about whaling, because it, it was a subject he hadn't really written about that, uh, written about... Um, in terms of his own experience, because, you know, he famously signed on as a whale man uh, in um, January 1841, which took him to the Pacific, you know, and he eventually jumped ship in Mar the Marquesa Islands in June 1842. Um, so, uh, you know, he, uh, the idea of doing a whaling book uh, was based on the fact that he had a lot of interesting experience to, experiences to relate that he hadn't put in any of his other books. Um, but he was also clearly feeling the impact of a rereading of Shakespeare uh, in the spring of 1849. He had read some Shakespeare before, but he apparently read through all the plays. Um, and, um, and then there was also a later... After he had started writing the book, you know, he, he had this famous encounter with Nathaniel Hawthorne in, in August 1850, after he was supposedly halfway through the book. Uh, but there's a famous controversy about uh, if he changed course when he was writing the book or whether he knew what he was doing uh, from the pretty much the beginning. Um, and it's there are all kinds of theories about um, you know, what the initial uh, inspiration was and who the characters were, but it was clearly more a sort of an adventure book than about whaling and less of an epic uh, tr Shakespearean tragedy with a, with a mad hero of Ahab. You know, it was more sort of a traditional um, picaresque, perhaps, uh, narrative of whaling and... Um, so he had written 
a certain amount and 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 by may he thought he you know was more than done with it uh because he was a very fast writer i mean he wrote uh redburn and white jacket in four months in the summer of 1849 yeah two months apiece he just sat down and cranked out these really excellent books uh and he was on track to do the same but then you know it slowed down a bit and he went in july he went up to pittsfield massachusetts to stay at the boarding house that was being run by his cousin and uh he had some time to relax and um reconnect with an, a part of the world that he knew intimately because his uncle uh used to live there and he visited him as a kid his uncle had a beautiful old house and farm in pittsfield and uh, so Melville was up there, and then he he met Hawthorne on August 5th, 1850, and decided at that point that, um, you know, he read Hawthorne. Hawthorne was living uh, in Lenox, which is um, not very far from, from Pittsfield. You know, it's, I think it's about eight miles or so, ten miles south. And uh, so the the legend is that he changed course in his creation of Ahab and sort of made him into a sort of Hawthornian um, uh, sort of hero villain hmm. uh, with some Gothic elements. And he spent the rest of well, then in in September 1850, he decided he had to move up to Pittsfield, so he bought a house. He had a very nice place in New York City they shared with his brother, a very big um, house with you know, good plumbing and hot water. And he moved up to Pittsfield and, and uh, bought a, a house that you know, had outdoor plumbing and, and, and outdoor well water. and It was much more challenging in terms of the physical circumstances. But he wanted to be near Hawthorne, and I think he wanted to save money, too. Uh, living in the country so he moved up there so he was in the thick of writing the book still and he spent the fall and winter finishing it and then by about may he he was pretty much done with it but he he uh did more rewriting i think in june as well but by the summer of 1850 he had pretty much written so i have a number of questions given so the the background information that you've given us thus yeah. far so probably easier to answer than the other or i don't know maybe i'm totally mixed up about this so the first is why this wasn't immediately received with great fanfare right it seems so obvious to me now why this is so wonderful why it took so long for the zeitgeist to figure out something so beautifully had been introduced to the world and the second is if this did start off as just sort of this whaling adventure story, um, and I'll tell you, if you do read this, you learn more about whales than you will from nearly any other experience in life. Yeah, yeah. I feel I'm a little bit of a whale expert now. But if Melvin, if this feeds into any of the, the legends or theories about what may have caused some course correction um, while Melville was writing this, is that this seems to be someone who's got something intensely profound to communicate to us. It sounds like within this story that that Melville has this sort of feverish desire to communicate something to us about the excesses of philosophy, um, something about esoteric religion, something about the unfathomable nature of the, the ground of all being, or um, the problems with, I guess, what uh, he would call ontic theology or something like that or monotheism so i guess what i'm asking here is did did melville have some sort of spiritual awakening did he kind of did it all sort of hit him out of, out of the blue or how long was he meditating on these ideas can you trace them back earlier than moby dick because it seems like it's that that seems to be what makes this novel so great is that he does have this um this this uh this incredibly important message that he wants to get across in regards to those subjects. Yeah. Well, let's take the, the issue of um, publication and reception later. Um, oh, sure. Because uh, that's that's very complicated. And, 
Oh, okay. It's worth I, I, worth I, I, a review in its own. But let me just uh, say this, that, uh, you know, Melville was an omnivorous reader. So he, uh, you know, starting in his teens, he was just consuming huge amounts of fiction and uh, eventually uh, nonfiction and then philosophy. And uh, he... Uh, his formal education uh, was really spotty after the age of 12. Uh, hmm. I mean, he, he got a good solid uh, primary and, and sort of early uh, sort of uh, middle school education. But, you know, when his father went bankrupt um, and the family moved up to Albany in 1850, um, Melville just had a couple of years at the Albany Academy and then he had to leave. His father died. Um, in 1832, and after that, he went to work in his uncle's bank as a as he as a teenager, you know, as a clerk. <clears throat> and then he only got um, another year or two uh, back at school. He he polished up his Latin, and he probably had some Greek as well. And then he also took some courses in um, surveying and because. Um, uh, he was trying to get some practical skills. I think the idea was that he would get a job uh, working uh, on the um, on the Erie Canal because they they were doing some uh, renovation work and uh, expansion of some of the waterways there. Um, so he was, you know, self-educated, and uh, you know, he was very much an original thinker. So he wasn't bound by the uh, sort of traditional curriculum of the college at the time, which uh, had a standardized uh, formula. I mean, a lot of it was classics um, or uh, getting young men ready for the ministry. And then they usually end, they had a final senior year course, usually with a college president on moral philosophy, you know, and they pretty much learn Scottish, uh, uh, you know, Enlightenment philosophers, uh, common sense philosophers, mm -hmm. um, and that was the standard curriculum. Um, so Melville, uh, he, must have, he must have hated his his college president. <laughs> he's not he is not uh, fond of philosophy in this text, although yeah. he gets he gets very philosophical to critique it. Yeah, uh, but he, um, uh, I mean, he just he just was constantly consuming new new books and uh, um, you know he came from a fairly literate family and they circulated books amongst each other and uh, his father was you know well educated although he didn't he didn't go to college um, but um, so he was uh, one of the key elements was that you know he wasn't he wasn't hemmed in by any particular dogmas. Mm. I mean, his family was fairly religious. His his mother's family was Dutch Reform, and uh, that's a pretty strongly uh, Calvinistic denomination, you know, like the Presbyterians and Congregationalists. So he uh, he got an exposure to that, particularly when he was living in Albany, you know, because his grandmother was uh, alive and uh, a strong influence on the family at the time. His father died. His father was a Unitarian. So he came, uh, he got a, a sort of a liberal theological education from his father and that tradition. And then after his father died, he was thrown into the world of Dutch reform Calvinism. And uh, I think quite he... Quite the swing. <laughs> I think he... Uh, he resented it, you know, he, because yeah. he, um, I think he was very conscious of the fact his father died, you know, a bankrupt, and he couldn't understand why he, his father, um, who was a very loving, uh, you know, generous parent, why he should, you know, lose all of his money and, and die this horrible death, raving, you know, because he had, uh, he died of, we're not really sure what he died of, but he he uh, made a winter trip. He, he went across the Hudson River on foot 
uh, to get back to Albany from New York City. Uh, he crossed the frozen Hudson and he came back. He was already, you know, shivering and he, I must, he must have had pneumonia. And then I think he had some kind of um, cerebral, uh, you know, uh, water on the brain or whatever. I mean, he was, his mind was wandering the last. I think week or two before he died uh, of exposure, pretty much, and and that was a very uh, had a very strong strong impact on young Mel. You know, he's twelve when that happened, and he you know he was surrounded by this Dutch Reformed tradition that says God uh, is everything is predestined and everything God does is right, and you know some people just have to accept the fact that damn and um, embrace that idea. So he definitely uh, felt a certain amount of, you know, angst about his own family situation, which seeded a kind of unorthodox skepticism towards Christian um, tradition, because at the time the country was in the grips of a, a serious evangelical revival. and. Uh, uh, it was probably the most pervasively Christian time of American history, you know, 1830s and and, and 40s. Um, you know, there were all kinds of revivals, and people like Charles Grandison Finney were very active in the in the 1830s, leading these revivals and uh, um, you know seeking conversions. Um, and Melville. Uh, he never got involved in that. N no one in his family was, you know, had any kind of climactic conversion experience. Although they, most of them were fairly religious. I mean, his sister Augusta, uh, with whom he was close, was, you know, she, she uh, ended up as a, as a, spinster. Uh, he and she was religious. His mother was very religious too, and his mother was very upset by Moby Dick and and the the, the fact that her son had supposedly written a book that was very unorthodox, unconventional. So would it be fair to say that Moby Dick is not the result of one sort of epiphany or penetrating insight that he was struggling with these themes well, from, I think, like, from like the age of 13 and on and, and that well, you could see traces of it in other books? Uh, I think his if, if there's any one theme uh, of this book and, and some of his other books, and this is what is the focus of my own book on Moby Dick. Um, Feel free to plug and, away. <laughs> uh, okay, here it is. <laughs> here it is. Inscrutable Malice. Uh, this came out in 2012. Uh, That's the, beautiful. The Odyssey, Eschatology, and the Biblical Sources of Moby Dick. So, the Odyssey is the key idea here. You know, how can a God who is all powerful and all good? allow for the existence of evil. I mean, what purpose does it serve for a good God to sanction evil in the world, right? So you have to explain it. I mean, it's a logical contradiction. So you have to sort of bend over backwards to say, well, you know, it's really humanity's fault, you know, because they, they were given all these great things, and then they screwed up in the Garden of Eden, you know, by letting their temptations of for knowledge and whatever, you know, run away with them. Or evil is some kind of a positive factor in our life because it makes us grow morally, you know. It allows, us, for, allows for us to have free will and to choose yeah, faith over yeah. it. Yeah, we have to have, if there's free will, there has to be a chance to screw up and do evil things. And, and uh, the idea, other idea is, of course, yeah, it's the devil's fault. The devil is there, uh, but he's always, he's never more powerful than God. You know, he's eventually going to be destroyed, but God lets him go around to um, test people and to, to tempt know, find, to deceive, to, yes. And to make sure that they're, you know, doing the right thing. Um, so, uh, you know, Christianity has a problem because it's monotheistic, doesn't allow for a separate god of evil. You know, other religions have entities that are, that are you know, evil by nature and, and the gods fight it out so that, uh, uh, you know, you somehow, you, you can uh, uh, see the origins of evil in a, in a separate deity. But 
Christianity um, has ended up with with the devil, uh, who it's interesting in Judaism. You know, Satan was he evolved from um, a figure who was an employee of the god. You know, Yahweh's uh, sort of uh, prosecuting attorney was his name was Satanas. You know, and um, he probably came in to Judaism under Persian influence, um, you know, because the Jews were uh, under the, the, the reign of Persia for a couple of centuries. Um, and uh, so, and then Christianity took the Satan figure who was actually in Judaism a part of God as his uh, sort of understrapper going around looking looking up you know seeing if people are doing the right thing and then Christianity made him into a, a total opponent of God um, who uh, evolved the whole mythology uh, you know and took elements of the Old Testament to make make this new figure you know like um, Lucifer the idea of Lucifer well Lucifer was originally based on a one passage in the book of Isaiah describing uh, a criticism of uh, uh, a, you know a ruler of Babylon and he was called you know he was a fallen uh, figure and that the name was transferred to the Christian devil completely ahistorically um, so little bits and pieces of the Old Testament were taken on and then of course the the god Pan of uh, the Greek, uh, ancient Greeks, you know, fed into the devil figure as well. You know, the the horns and the goatish, uh, right, and hoofs play, and things. Play the pan pipes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so our Christian devil is is a you know he's an fascinating mythological figure. Um, but still, the problem of evil then is is Melville's big issue, right? Because he sees he's in a culture where everyone is telling you you've got to worship you know this great christian god and we got to put the bible at the center of our lives you know it's almost like a christian you know sharia uh, <laughs> trying to get people on board um and um uh you know for melville it said okay well if you have a christian god why is the world so screwed up you know why does christianity uh, first of all, uh, do evil things. You know, they send, uh, you know, we have these Christian missionaries going to all parts of the world, but uh, what kind of improvement are they making on these people's lives? He, you know, Melville saw what happened in the, the Pacific where um, the advent of Christianity to uh, Tahiti, to Hawaii, to the Marquesa Islands led to the introduction of. Um, uh, you know, terrible diseases when when uh, Europeans arrived there. Um, it led to commercial exploitation. Uh, the idealism of Christ was not on display when the full panoply of uh, American and English and French colonizers arrived on these places. So Melville saw this happening and he said, you know, this is terrible. Christianity shouldn't be doing this. What? Why are we such hypocrites that we are peddling this beautiful religious ideal, and then what we do is we uh, kill and and indoctrinate and you know make these people's lives miserable. To to be fair, as as a defender <laughs> of, of, of the Christian faith, I think what what often happens is that individuals hybridize uh, whatever sort of political ideology they have with whatever the truth is that's revealed within the biblical text. So it wouldn't surprise me at all if a lot of um, individuals that lo look to oppress and suppress indigenous populations on those islands um, took the Bible as, a, as some sort of weaponized means to do that. Yeah. But the real message of the Bible yeah. I don't think would ever would ever no. be a part of that. I think it's a big problem that we have near, nearly in any time the Bible is introduced into culture is that there's always some sort of something in between it, some sort of conservative yeah. ideology, yeah. social justice ideology. There's always something that acts as some sort of 
intercessor between us and Christ. And I wouldn't be surprised if the same thing happened in the scenario that you're talking about there with those island nations. And yeah. I will say this other thing. There is one other way, and I don't know how well Melville – I can't – not off the top of my head how well Melville addresses this issue about trying to deal with the Odyssey and the problem of evil. And perhaps you take it up in your book, is this idea of there being this great chain of being. Yeah. As well. Yeah. Right. That somehow that you know, that humans have to experience mortality, die with water on the brain, experience the temptation of the devil or whatever for the fruition of the greater cosmic eschatology to unfold. So angels themselves may not have to deal with the devil in the same way that humans do, but angels don't necessarily have the free will that humans do, but it also contributes towards this opening up and this revealing of the unfolding of the Christian truth or something like that. I'm not sure if you dealt with that idea at all within yeah. your book on eschatology and if it relates to Melville at all. I'm not sure it's a really satisfactory answer as well but it is one that is I, I i've at least been able to trace it back to augustine i'm not sure yeah well there's a there's the famous book of uh, love joy you know the great chain of being which I've, I've read a while ago um but uh i mean that those ideas were um uh sort of part of the platonic inheritance that we yeah. know of god because yeah. you know he was a he was a serious student of classical philosophy especially plato you know the Platonic dialogues had a huge influence on him, and he read them in his late twenties. That's one of my favorite um, lines when he talks about the Ohio honey hunter. Who, oh yeah, right. Who's, that gets entombed in Boston. Boston. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. yeah. Um. Yeah. When he has, uh, when they're pulling out Testigo from the from the whale's uh, head that's fallen in, uh, he's fallen into case with the sperm, the sperm oil all around him. Um. So um, anyway, uh, just to get back to the, 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 what I think is the dominant theme of the book, you know, the theodicy notion, um, hold on, um, is, uh, it's, 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 <laughs> hold on. One That's second. okay. Don't worry about it. Not planned. Hello. <laughs> it's live TV. It yeah, happens. I'm, on, I'm doing my interview. <laughs> okay. Okay. Bye. Okay. Huh. Unscripted, folks. We Unscripted, we keep it real. Yeah. <laughs> it's real. It's real, folks. Uh, so the theodicy issue is channeled through the Bible, right? Because you don't, you know, it's an issue that is filtered through texts and. For Melville, uh, the big text, of course, was the book of Job, uh, the great oh, yes. Old Testament, uh, uh, you know, famous uh, drama uh, about why some terrible thing would happen to one of the uh, most uh, righteous uh, men and uh, how Job dealt with that. You know, he spent a lot of time uh, trying to exonerate himself, having his three friends say, well, you didn't do this and you didn't do that. And he said, no, I did all those things that I was supposed to do. And then finally having God appear as a voice from the whirlwind, um, sort of telling Job he was right to be upset and questioning and you know, hurling lots of abusive rhetoric at God, you know. He sides with Job and, and against the friends who were more devout, and which is kind of surprising. But then uh, his basic position is to tell Job that he's a puny little human and he wasn't around to create the world like God was. And he wasn't there to, um, you know, create all these natural wonders and keep everything in check, keep the sea from rising too high and killing off or fighting against these mythical beasts like uh, Behemoth and Leviathan. Um, so Leviathan, you know, is the final consummation of God's speech to Job about how he does not control the world. Only God was able to fight against this great big sea creature, Leviathan. He was a sea monster from, um, uh, you know, Middle Eastern religion. Um, and so Job is sort of browbeaten into submission by 
the deity and uh, finally says, yeah, I'm sorry, I made a big mistake. I, I repent in dust and ashes. And then God turns around and gives him back all the things that he took away, you know, his wife and his, well, his daughters and all his property. So he got, he gets all what he lost back uh, even more. So it has a little fairy tale ending. But uh, most people think that the essence of the book of Job is, is the, uh, the rhetoric of accusation that Job hurls against the deity. It's a really fascinating uh, book of the Bible. A number of philosophers and psychoanalysts have taken it up. Yeah. Carl Jung has yeah. very, Carl Jung wrote a whole book on it. Kant yeah. was very very interested in the exchange, and yeah. Kierkegaard wrote, uh, yeah. I believe, in repetition about about the exchange. Yeah. It's something that yeah. really um, captures the imagination of a lot of great thinkers. Yeah. Well, that's what my book on Moby Dick is all about. Uh, oh, cool! And, and <laughs> so we'll, we'll add you to the list of Kant and Kierkegaard. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I did a lot of research on Job while I was writing this book or before, and um, I tried to bring in all of these uh, figures who who had uh, you know meditated on Job, and uh, so the theodicy issue is filtered into the book through the figure of Job, and Ahab is a Job figure, even though he's associated with the biblical Ahab. Uh, you know, who is a uh, Israelite king who he he angered Yahweh more than any other king. I mean, that was his legend, right? Because he he married a pagan princess Jezebel uh, from Tyre, and he allowed all these Baal uh, uh, temples to stand and the worshippers. Yeah. So he was trying to create a kind of cosmo cosmopolitan kingdom right and uh, he, he he upset God uh, apparently uh, to no degree and to no end and uh, he committed a criminal act by um, expelling a guy named Nathan he saw his uh, his uh, I'm sorry Naboth his uh, vineyard you know he had a nice little vineyard and he said um, I'd like that property um, and uh, eventually had him, you know, judicially executed at the instigation of his wife. Uh, he eventually paid for his sins. You know, he was attacked by the prophet Elijah, who said, you know, get with the program or you're going to have a bad end. And and um, Ahab was eventually killed by the Assyrians at a, at a battle of, um, uh, 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 what was it, Gilead, something Gilead. Anyway, you can read it in um, uh, the first book of Kings, it's about chapter 18, 19, 20, 21. Uh, so Melville had, had this model figure who uh, was a opponent of the deity and angered God, right? So that that created the opportunity for a sort of gothic anti-hero to, to be created. But the fact is that a lot of Ahab's uh, rhetoric is very um, tinged with Job and accents and and uh, and ideas. So, and we can really sympathize with those because you know he's a hero villain. You know, half of him is a loathsome tyrant who takes over the Pequod and uh, you know makes everyone his accessory to uh, the the quest for the white whale. And at the same time, he's also coming out with these speeches about, you know, why doesn't God show his face? And I got this horrible injury. My leg was chewed off by a whale. And I went through hell. Uh, you know, why did it happen to me? Um, well, it's not quite that. Uh, there's no real self-pity in the character. But there's a lot of legitimate outrage at the treatment of human beings by... A supposedly good God that now, so, powers so, Ahab's rhetoric. You know, I remember this passage about how he would talk about how he would fight the sun if it ever, yeah, exactly, if it ever, if it ever messed with him. Well, of course, that's a pun, you know, on S O N S U N. Oh, uh, okay. the, the, the son of righteousness. Well, that's um, well, well. What I'm trying to get at here yeah. is, are we to think of Moby Dick as God and him sort of? trying to exact some sort of retribution 
yeah. on God for imposing this physical evil upon him of, of, of having a peg leg. Yeah. Is that, yeah, is that kind of the I, idea? Yeah, I mean, the, the fact is, in the book of Job, uh, Leviathan is, he, he's called, in, in the study of mythology, compared to mythology, you call him a chaos monster, right? So he's sort of a symptom of the return of chaos. The idea is you create civilization by making all the monsters go to the edge and push them back. You know, they'll never disappear, but you can you can think that maybe you've got some time um, where the monster is, is going to be inactive. So um, God originally, uh, you know, or Yahweh, um, as a divine warrior, fought against Leviathan and... Um, as a as a, a creature of chaos, right? And um, so, in a way, uh, but Ahab is 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 fighting against um, Leviathan, the chaos monster, uh, and he's kind of uh, accusing God of being um, behind this evil creature, right? It's he's sort of his his uh, agent. Uh, who was getting back at Ahab because Ahab apparently uh, became kind of a free thinker before his leg was cut off. I mean, there's hints that he was, he sort of was tempting fate by, um, uh, you know, becoming defiant even before his leg was uh, removed by this, by this whale. And, and, and it could be that the whale was doing God's bidding by uh, punishing Ahab for his, blasphemous acts you know there's a famous uh when elijah warns uh ishmael and Queequeg not to go on the pequod he cites these legendary stories about how ahab did these nasty things like spitting into the communion right. uh, um, uh, cup in a church in uh you know peru and uh so all these stories about Ahab. <clears throat> so in a way, Ahab, he's, he's a culture hero in that he's trying to kill a whale that he thought, that he thinks is, is a modern chaos monster who's a symbol of evil, you know. So somehow he's going to rid the world of evil in a kind of a second coming role, you know, a messianic role. So he's taking on the role of a, of a savior figure, oh. but killing off the whale. At the same time, he's becoming himself a kind of satanic figure who is attacking uh, a symbol of the deity, the whale. You know, he's a white whale because, you know, the color white is, is associated in some ways with, you know, the, the, um, uh, the, the, in the book of Daniel, there's a figure called the Ancient of Days who's all white, you know, and that's one, orig one source of the, the white symbol of the whale um and so it's a weird sort of paradox in that ahab fighting the whale is kind of like uh, a messiah fighting against an evil monster to aid humanity and at the same time he's also a diabolical figure who's trying to mess with uh one of the great creatures of the world you know who's Who's sanctified by the deity, you know, in his color and his behavior. So the thing about Malville is there's always another layer of symbolism below whatever you think is there, right? Because he's never just on the surface. There are always two or three layers below the surface, and even more than that. Yeah, definitely. So, man. I, I, get, I should get back to our, our interview questions because yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll be talking here yeah. about four hours about this book. I mean, we yeah. usually could, we talk a hundred hours about it. So um, something I was going to ask you about, right, was yeah. the, the opening words, these, yeah. uh, you know, uh, call me Ishmael. Yeah. Um, <coughs> can you tell us some of the characteristics of this, of this narrator? Yeah, well, of course, Ishmael uh, was an illegitimate son of Abraham, right? And he, uh, so he is a figure of the outcast. You know, the same way Ahab is a sort of outcast political figure. Ishmael is a, is a cultural outcast, you know, much earlier on in, in uh, Israelite history. 
Um, so um, he's taking on this sort of outcast persona, um, and uh, you know, it's it's a it's a uh, it's a, a version of Melville himself. I mean, the voice, the experiences of Ishmael are based on Melville's own. Um, uh, uh, experience wailing some of it and uh, the sort of humor you know the the attempt to sort of uh, overcome adversity with humor and joking and skepticism all this is very much Melville's voice and you know he has Ishmael go to uh, New Bedford and then Nantucket to get to find his whaling ship well Melville himself went to Fairhaven Massachusetts which is right across from New Bedford. He never went to Nantucket to to get a whale ship, um, but he wanted to include that in the novel because that's it's kind of the uh, archetypal whaling island in Massachusetts, you know. Um, so the figure of Ishmael, you know, just as Ahab is steeped in the Old Testament uh, history of you know, Israelite king Ishmael himself is very much a, a biblically um, oriented figure. So, if you, you know, a lot of his jokes are based on biblical <coughs> ideas and images. And one of his roles in the book <coughs> is to sort of take on a role of a sort of a secular um, preacher. You know, because he's a lot of the chapters. Uh, you read about whaling have these final sort of moral messages. You know, he looks at some aspect of whaling about the whale line, or you know, getting the sperm out of the whale's head, and he discusses it in a in a way that te teaches you a lot about the anatomy of the whale. But he usually ends up with some kind of <clears throat> philosophical religious point. And what you find is that he's really um, preaching to the reader. You know, he's delivering these sermons periodically through the book. <coughs> Some of them actually based on, <coughs> you know, every sermon traditionally has a biblical text at its core. And uh, in Melville's case, he, he took a lot from St. Paul, the letters of St. Paul. So, you, you know, in my book as well, I, I trace the source of, of a lot of his this sort of sermonic style <clears throat> to actual texts in, in, in Romans and Corinthians and other parts of the New Testament. Um, so he, you know, Ishmael is trying to teach the reader uh, about life and he's taking religious texts but he's secularizing them. He's not He's not really trying to convert the reader to any kind of dogmatic Christianity. He's, he's taking Christianity as a sort of moral system and, and making it relevant to <clears throat> the world that he's experienced, you know, on the high seas in a, in a whaling vessel. Um, and he, uh, you know, the big paradigm is Ishmael is a, is a, a figure who accepts adversity and evil, you know, he takes it as he can and usually tries to joke about it. Um, and Ish and Ahab is the one who seeks revenge for injury. So there are two prototypes or paradigms for dealing with adversity and evil. You know, Ishmael absorbs it, learns by it, uh, makes a joke of it, um, accepts it, and Ahab uh, is much more uh, focused on revenge. And well, there's a, there's a little bit of a target, and there's a little bit of a morality tale given how the book ends up, right? <laughs> yeah, is, is, Ishmael is I, saved. I, I, Ishmael's, Ishmael's the only one that survives, right? Right, right. He, his friends uh, uh, coffin um, lifesaver floats and and saves him. So. Anyway, I trace this paradigm to uh, St. Paul's uh, letter to the Romans. You know, Romans 12 has a very interesting chapter where he's saying, you know, don't seek revenge. Let God seek revenge because, I mean, he's, he's um, following up on some Old Testament 
uh, language that you know only God can set things right in terms of ultimate justice and because revenge will just do terrible things to you um, you, uh, well, you're, taking, ending, you're, right? you're right. taking the place of God and seeking revenge and yes you invite violence and a cycle of retaliation um, so I think Melville had this passage very much in mind from Rome letter to the Romans as he uh, created these two paradigms of human experience in relation to evil you know the the one who accepts it and tries to learn from it uh, and the one who uh, can accept it and thinks of it as a um, as a you know uh, it's a constant uh, aggravation and a constant insult to their their ego um, and they've got to someone has to pay for it you know so we should probably move along a little bit here and yeah. talk about Ahab. Now you have mentioned the the correlate of Ahab in, in the Bible. And by the way, your familiarity with the Bible outclasses a lot of uh, Bible believing Christians. It's actually really quite incredible. It makes me want to go uh, try to memorize it. Like you've yeah. got it memorized there. Um, I, I'd love to know how you did that, but um, uh, what do you think about Ahab? I mean, would you like to say more about, the development of him as a character, I know. Um, yeah, you know, I love this. This, you know, I was listening to a lecture by Harold Bloom earlier today, and he described the, all of Moby Dick as uh, being a <laughs> kind of a Shakespearean prose poem. I don't yeah. know if you would call it that, yeah. but I mean, it, there, obviously, there are Shakespearean um, yeah elements through all this. I mean, is the Shakespearean overdone in Ahab? I mean, would you like to say more about the development of him as a character? Or? Yeah, well, one of the things I think a lot of readers feel if they don't have a problem with the the whaling material, <laughs> you know, they look at Ahab and they and they think of him as just a sort of operatic figure because he's he's there on the deck of a ship, uh, just spouting just superbly um, rounded sentences and. Uh, uh, you know, he's, he's, he's all kind of attitudinizing. Um, and they think, well, you know, it's not, this is not realistic fiction. Well, no, it's not. Um, I mean, it is semi-realistic in that uh, he has all the, the details right, the way things look, but, it, you know, it's a symbolic realism. And once you, you know, realize what you're reading is uh, yeah Shakespearean drama you know you're 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 getting kind of like a synthesis of Hamlet uh, King Lear um, Macbeth uh, it's kind of like a three-in-one bargain you know you don't have to <laughs> it's taking all the best of these great Shakespearean heroes and investing them in one modern anti-hero who's also steeped in uh, you know this biblical uh, mythology of Job and uh, and and King Ahab um, so you just have to appreciate Ahab as a character for his language for for his philosophical revolt against the deity uh, you know, you, you just have to treat it as drama when you're when you're reading a lot of his speeches and and realize that yeah he is half crazy. I mean this is this is someone who's a uh, you know. <laughs> well yeah well I love it I love it how it starts off he's like yeah well I just want to go out into the street and knock people's hats off their heads I better go a whaling yeah and I, at least uh, at least he well, knows the problem. Well that's Ishmael of course. You know, oh that was Ishmael. Yeah, oh, yeah Ishmael in the very beginning of the book. Yeah, Ahab, a, well, both of them are a little crazy, and that okay. that is that makes them spiritual kin, you know, because Ishmael, uh, he talks about having his humors, you know, his depressive humors. Right. And uh, and Ahab obviously is is a clinically depressed man because of his his rage at his uh, mutilation. You know, um, people don't realize that. You know, if you lose a leg in those circumstances, he's he was 
uh, amputated, his leg was amputated, and he had uh, a lot of incredible pain, right? And people who have uh, have lost limbs have this thing called phantom limb pain. Yes, yes. Where they feel, sometimes they feel this excruciating pain where they don't even have a limb. So for Ahab, it's, it's fascinating because Melville anticipated this modern medical mystery of, of the phantom limb, you know, sensation, which has been written about in the last few decades by um, some medical writers. That, and he anticipated this in that, you know, Ahab is feeling this terrible pain in his leg periodically when there's nothing there. For, and so for Ahab, it's like, why do I feel this pain? It must be God who's doing this to me. How can he allow me to have pain when there's no stupid leg to give me the pain anymore? You know? So that validates his whole uh, rage against the order of things and that he can suffer this terrible injury to his body ego uh, and also uh, be afflicted with this uh, crippling pain when... Um, by all logical explanations, there shouldn't be any. Um, so that's what is, you really want to read the character of Ahab as, you know, a great Shakespearean figure. You want to read him um, uh, as a, you know, as a representative whaling captain in terms of his, his the power that he had over his crew, right? There's, you know, a certain realism in the, in the position he has amongst his... Um, his mates, and you want to read him for uh, this this modern medical mystery of the phantom limb that uh, has has really shaped his his mentality. And there's also a hint that it's also left him sort of impotent. You know, the, right. the leg slipped when he was when he was home just before he sailed, and the 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 limb broke and maybe gashed his groin so that you know he somehow lost his, his potency. So this is the final insult for Ahab is that he's 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 taken his limb, he's taken his uh, self image, and then he's taken his male identity and, and you know trashed it. Right. Um, and that's why he's he's on this mission to to go against the deity. And that you know it's interesting because modern psychologists there is this, there, the idea of hating God is not completely unknown. You know, if people are very religious and terrible things happen to them, they can end up having oh, yeah. an uh, uh, obsession with why, why did the, you know, how can I like a God who does this to me? And, you know, I hate the God who did this to me. And, um, uh, you know, well, just they, because they, there's no explanation, there's no legitimate explanation for it. Right. Well, they would think that they should ought to be favored in some way if they've drawn closer to God, if they kept His commandments yeah. and revered right. Him and stuff like that. Um, I believe yeah. it's I believe it's Psalm seventy three that talks a great deal about that, um, and it seems like people who are in open apostasy, um, yeah, seem to succeed quite well in the world. Those who are completely yeah, exactly. completely irreligious and immoral and yeah. Uh, unfeeling towards their common man are the ones that seem to climb the highest. So yeah. um, it, it's, it's a theme that's there for Bible readers and for people who are very close, uh, feel themselves very close to God. But um, the advice is sort of to uh, pray it, not say it, uh, to yeah. not actually, to not yeah. openly blaspheme God, but right. to, to ask for counsel during such troubled times. Right. Uh, so we talked a little bit about, um, some of the symbolic nature of, of the white whale. I don't, I, I don't know if we, when we were talking about it earlier, if it was exhaustive, if you want to say anything else about the symbolism of the white whale, because I imagine people have written so many books about what the white whale symbolizes. But yeah. we didn't really, outside of its whiteness, we haven't really discussed any yeah. of the, I guess we talked a little bit about its magnitude. Um, but we haven't talked a great deal about its physical characters and how the physical and the symbolical relate to one another. Yeah. Well, I mean, the fascinating thing about the Moby Dick is, I mean, he only appears in the last three chapters of the book. So you, right. you have you know, 135 chapters, and he's only in the end. Of course, he's talked about, right. and he's mythologized, and, and Ahab uh, you know, initiates the whole quest uh, 
uh, in the chapter called the quarter deck when he's um, saying that this the, the voyage to hunt whale oil will be geared towards hunting this this one particular whale that injured him and uh, so the whale is discussed periodically um, is this whale an anomaly? Uh, is is this whale its well, own species an anomaly, like the remnant of some thing that was supposed to be extinct? I mean, well, he's a you know he's an albino whale, so albinos are unusual, but you know they happen periodically. And the fact is that he's waste that he's ultimately based on the the a whale that really existed named Mocha Dick. You know, Mocha Dick. Well, there's an island of Mocha off uh. Chile. And he was a famous whale in the 1820s and 30s. And um, a writer named uh, J. J. Uh, Reynolds published in the in the Knickerbocker magazine a story about hunting of this Mocha Dick. Right. So Melville didn't invent. Well, he invented the name Moby Dick, but he was taking an actual whale that lived in the Pacific called Mocha Dick, changing the first word of the name. And um, uh, so Mocha Dick, though, was killed by an intrepid American whaleman in the story. We don't know, you know, what actually happened if the, if the whale, the, the legendary living whale was killed um, as it was in the story. So Melba read the story probably um, you know, 1840, 39, 40. And uh, so he had an image of a legendarily ferocious whale. Because Mocha Dick was huge. He had white and gray spots on him. He wasn't totally albino, but he was unusual in his appearance. And he was very, uh, he was like a, the supreme challenge to fight against. And he destroyed lots of whale boats off the coast of Chile. Uh, so Melville took this uh, this legendary whale and he infused him with sort of biblical meaning, um, tying him in with the biblical Leviathan of the Book of Job. And in fact, when you look at the chapter, the one chapter when Leviathan is described in Job chapter 41, uh, a lot of the, the language is very poetic uh, about the ferocity of the creature Leviathan, you know. Uh, who was sort of a, he was an interesting sort of fire-breathing monster living in the ocean. Um, and uh, kind of like a dragon almost. Right. Uh, so, but the interesting thing is the last three chapters of Moby Dick, you can actually parallel certain statements about Leviathan with some of the action in the hunt, in the actual chase for Moby Dick. So it's clear that Melville is basing the actual physical image of this white whale on elements of Leviathan from the Book of Job. I mean, no doubt he is an actual physical whale. You know, he's he's very uh, concretely described. But if you look at the way he's hunted and some of the actions that he takes, uh, there is certain biblical language uh, that seeps into the descriptions to tie in the fact that what we're seeing here is a battle between a, uh, you know, a sort of flawed messiah figure of Ahab trying to kill um, this chaos monster um, who just happens to be a whale, you know, a white whale, because the whale is the largest, you know, mammal in the world. So <clears throat> it's 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 uh, appropriate that. Uh, he would be, uh, you know, the one creature that would represent the sort of mythical dragon sea creature would be a would be a whale. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, and the funny thing is, after Moby Dick was published uh, in October, 1851, uh, Melville read about the sinking of a ship by a whale uh, called the Anne Alexander. And he said to his friend, uh, Edward Dykink, you know, has my evil art conjured up this whale? Because there was not much of a record of whales sinking ships. The only uh, example of that, of course, is the famous story of the Essex 
um, which has you know been made into uh, a movie recently in the heart of the sea. Um, the Essex uh, was a whale ship in uh, uh, 18, 19, 18, 20 that was uh, sunk um, off the coast of South America by a whale. And it was one of the very rare occurrences of that type of event that um, also stuck in Melville's mind. It was one of the precipitating factors in, in writing the book, in fact, was the, the famous story of the sinking of the Essex and then the survival of the crew and the incidents of cannibalism because they they went out in uh, you know two or three whale boats and and um, most of them died um, on the way to get back to South America. The irony is if they had sailed west, they were not far from the Marquesa Islands uh, where Melville had later jumped ship and uh, you know they would have survived if they went there, but they were afraid that there were cannibals <laughs> on the Marquesa Island, but so instead they sailed east to South America and ended, ended up cannibalizing each other. So one of the great ironies of whaling history. That's uh, insane. <laughs> so Melville read the book uh, that was uh, written by Owen Chase about this experience of, of the sinking of a whale. I, I'm sorry, sinking of a ship by a, by a, 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 a male sperm whale, a bur, bull sperm whale. And the other irony is, is that it may have been that the whales attacked these ships not because they were enraged that these whale men were killing other whales, but that they were thinking of it as a male rival. And ah. uh, so they rammed into it because that was sort of their, you know, response to a, uh, a threatening male, you know, who was in their poaching on their territory. Um, uh, or, you know, they were just showing dominance, male dominance. Well, something I was going to ask you, and that's very interesting, um, you know, you mentioned how little Moby Dick is described in the story, and I wonder if that the, the non-attributes, the non-qualities are important for what Melville is trying to communicate in this story. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, we, talk about, we talk about, like, sort of in the Old Testament or something like that, Jehovah never or reveals his face, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. And yeah. And and there's something sort of similar here where Moby Dick yeah. doesn't really reveal himself to the, um, yeah. yeah. Uh, so so there we can so the lack of uh, Moby Dick's physical presence sort of indicates some of those symbolic yeah. qualities that we were talking yeah. about as well. Yeah, I mean it makes him elevates him into a, a mythological uh, creature with these divine uh, associations. It seems um, like to me. It seems like to me too. It's not just the whale. That is this this symbol, but what the environment that the whale lives in as well. This oceanic abyss. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know if you're right, but I mean, and there's kind of one in the same, right? We talked a little bit about how this whale is some sort of servant or some sort of extension of the deity or something like yeah. that. And I wonder if we can if we can talk about the sea in kind of the same way. Hmm. Is this? Yeah. Sort well, of, the the sea. In a Near Eastern, ancient Near Eastern mythology, the sea was an agent of chaos, you know, because the sea would flood um, your low lying areas and it was uncontrollable. Uh, so it had an identity as, uh, uh, you know, in ancient uh, Babylonian Canaanite religion, you know, and in these religions, sea was a mythological entity and uh, and and usually evil you know like moat mot in canaanite religion you know baal was the hero moat was was at, well i'm sorry he's a he's a figure of death um but he uh he's associated with the sea and in moby dick of course there are the chapters where the sea is personified as a as an untamed element that you know is beyond human control so it's a it's a kind of symbol of chaos, the original chaos out of which uh, creation emerged. And, and right. the Jonah, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, the Noah story is uh, invoked a few times in Moby Dick, particularly at the end, you know, where the, 
the great uh, shroud of the sea uh, flowed ha as it had done for the past 5,000 years, you know, the last few lines of the last chapter. Um, the idea is that this is, the flood has returned, you know, the Noah, the Noahic flood is back um, the way it happened, uh, you know, early in um, Old Testament history. Uh, so, you know, humans try to create order and they try to maintain their creative community, but they're surrounded by the sea, which is an element of chaos. You know, as we as we know well, um, uh, with our own uh, creeping coastlines and uh, uh, you know uh, tsunami uh, and uh, you know, oceanic events of yeah. recent history. Yeah. So that the, the the whale is an you know living in the element of chaos. It is an, a symbol of chaos as well. On, based on Old Testament ideas. So we should probably talk a little bit about the mechanics and the gears of the, the story. Um, you know, the plot of Moby Dick veers between comedy, natural yeah. history, ep epic adventure, melodrama, and tragedy. So how can such a varied combination of elements make for a successful literary narrative? <clears throat> well, I think what Melville is trying to do with Moby Dick is, is make the ultimate... Um, synthesis of literary genres. Uh, so he's, you know, his big ambition was to sort of create a new Bible, right? The Bible was the model for him. And just as the Bible is a compilation of narratives and wisdom literature and tragedy, um, he's trying to create a book of life, a, a paradigm of the human experience. So he's got to have comedy, he's got to have tragedy. There's an amazing uh, disquisition, uh, series of disquisitions on natural history. You know, the history of the whale is all about um, writing some very astute natural history according to the, the um, ideas that were current at the time in the 1840s and 50s about, about the natural world. You know, Ishmael is very much up on the latest information about um, how to describe uh, animals and their anatomy and the behavior, uh, which he's doing for whales. So you're getting a, um, a really encyclopedic overview of, you know, the human experience in a, uh, a format that is designed to sort of rival the Bible in its um, complexity and coherence as a, as a narrow, as a single narrative. Um, anyway, so that's, well, that's, that's, a, that's very, it's very interesting that Melville would, I mean, that mirrors, right. This sort of messianic figure that Ahab is right. Yeah. Where he feels like he's got to do this incredible feat. And it's interesting that Melville would take on a similar sort of, yeah. It was it grew out of the whole romantic movement because you know people like uh, Wordsworth and Coleridge they they were trying to create a modern sort of equivalent to biblical truth you know with their sort of new uh, language of human emotion and feeling and uh, sincerity uh, so Malvo was was really following up on what other writers have been attempting to do in terms of uh, a secular scripture, you know, making literature as powerful as, as it was for people uh, who read the Bible, you know. Um, it is interesting. I was thinking about it today when I was in church and going over that, that Psalm, Psalm 73 that I mentioned earlier. And it's, I believe it's written by a, a minor character named Asaph or something yeah. like that. And um, his own book of the Bible, but has written more than say like Jonah or, yeah. or, or James. And just what a, if you really want fame to be included in the Bible is the best way to get fame. Yeah, right? yeah exactly. I, can, I can understand. Yeah, yeah. And can understand the impulse to create a secular Bible. Yeah. Um, so, so, 
you think we yeah, should uh, have another session on this uh, eventually? We can do a Follow we can up? do a part two. We can do a part, part two. two. I mean, we can keep going, or we can do a part two another yeah. time. Because I think my schedule is probably going to require a cutoff at well, this point. And, yeah, and I think it's pretty. Like to, and we only got through half of our talking points, I think, though, right? Or yeah, well, we. Over. Yeah. And we maybe want to invent some more talking points too. Well, I yeah. I thoroughly enjoyed this. I mean, um, I learned so much about the text from you today, and I mean, this has been one of my favorite sessions that we've done together. And hopefully, part two, part three, yeah, will be uh, yeah. just as good. Okay. I mean, you, it was really incredible what you taught me today. Okay, well, Luke, you you have to read my book too. Um, I would love to. I would a love lot to. Of what you talk about in the Psalms. I I do include some. Uh, of the many allusions to the Psalms as well. It's another is, important text. For, can I get the book? Can I get the book on Amazon? How can people get the book? Uh, yeah, it's on Amazon. Um, Inscrutable Malice, Jonathan A. Cook. Okay. Um, but I can also loan you a copy. <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll I'll go yeah. buy one. I'll, yeah. I'll buy one tonight, and maybe we can do a whole uh, a whole seminar devoted just to your book, or yeah. or we could thread or thread it in whatever we want to do. Yeah. Okay. Let's do uh, that. Whatever you want to do. Okay. All right. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you, Dr. Cook. I mean, man, that was really incredible. And I'll go get your book right now. Okay. All Good. right. Take Enjoyed care. Enjoyed this. Okay. Bye. All right. Bye.